Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Saturday morning Bible study discussion. We're so glad you could join us. It's the first one since our summer break. And we are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And Thomas from New York is our moderator today. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. So I'll start out with our quote. The infinite is the infinite is one, and this one is spirit. Spirit is God, and this God is infinite good. God being infinite, he is the only basis for science. This simple statement of oneness is the only possible correct version of Christian science. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hello. We've already We're reading started. the quote. Oh, okay. Spirit is infinite. Therefore, spirit is all. There is no matter is not only the axiom of true Christian science, but it, it is the only basis upon which this science can be demonstrated. So this is from The Way of Wisdom um, in Miscellany, um, pages 356 to 357. So I don't know about others, but um, I was not familiar with The Way of Wisdom. Um, Anyway, hopefully other people have discovered it or already know about it. And if you uh, have any thoughts about this, I'd appreciate that. Well, this is another way of saying that God is all, isn't it? And the allness of God is the fundamental precept of Christian science. The allness and goodness of God. It's the only thing we can unite. We all can unite with. And therefore go forward with it. The allness of God. It is interesting because the very last part of miscellany... Um, Mrs. Eddy is addressing Augusta Stetson and the building of her church in New York City, some of you know about. Um, but it's interesting that Tom picked this because it's about the unity, and yet this was one of the first divisions that came up while Mrs. Eddy was still here. Dear Mrs. Eddy, her last few years at Chestnut Hill, what is it? What was it three or something? She had the next friend's suit, and then she had this with Mrs. Stetson. And part of the way of wisdom says, which <laughs> sometimes I don't know if Thomas knows what he's doing when he, <laughs> but he, it's amazing what he does with these questions because it all gets so intertwined in such important lessons for us all. So she writes, um, well, the only incentive of, mis of a mistaken sense is malicious animal magnetism, the name of all evil, and this must be understood. And then she says, and this is in The Way of Wisdom, I have crowned the Mother Church building with the spiritual modesty of Christian science, which is its jewel. Spiritual modesty. Mm -hmm. When my dear brethren in New York desire to build higher, to enlarge their phylacteries, and demonstrate Christian science to a higher extent, they must begin on a holy spiritual foundation, than which there is no other, and proportionably estimate their success and glory of achieve achievement only as they build upon the rock of Christ, the spiritual foundation." This will open the way widely and impartially to their never-ending success to salvation and eternal Christian science. And then spirit is infinite, therefore spirit is all. It's a true axiom of Christian science. 
So you see how she was dealing with this, what was going on in New York City. She did everything um, to keep keep the peace and keep everyone united, right? Yeah. Eventually, Augusta Stetson and all her students were excommunicated by the board of directors. I just find it interesting on this topic of unity because this is something we all need to be aware of. We need to be aware of the history of our church and how Mrs. Eddy handled these issues. And as far as I know, it was not to excommunicate anybody. So, Tom, did you know that <laughs> that was part of this way of wisdom? Uh, no, it did not, but that's fascinating. <laughs> it is very fascinating. Because I'm even so glad before, to hear that. Yeah. Before, I brought the books on Augustus Stetson even before I knew. I didn't read all of this till just this morning, <laughs> just now, actually. And I had already been prepared to speak about Augustus Stetson. So it, it shows the one mind in operation here and the deeper lessons that need to be learned because we can all just talk about unity and how wonderful that is, but we need to examine what happens and why there is sometimes not unity. Right now, that not unity seems to be raging yeah, in right. every direction. Yeah. So, so go, anybody else? Or go ahead, Tom. Well, well I, I would say sometimes unity and uh, pardon me for getting a little editorial here, but unity in the uh, Boston organization is, uh, if you don't agree, you leave. Yes. I, I don't see how we can be united if you, you have such different uh, thoughts about God. It's not, it's not possible. That's it's true. not possible. That's right. And I think it's also interesting that Mrs. Eddy uses the word, you know, modesty. Yeah. spiritual modesty the uh, it, because the I, Augustus Stetson built a very large church in New York mm -hmm. very large church and it was probably too large for the situation because it enraged the material in the other people in New York City who became jealous and so forth and wanted to destroy something. So they tried to destroy Augusta Stetson. But also, what was her motive? Why that huge, uh, I, I believe it was so beautiful and all that. Why, why that? Well, oh. exactly. It was perhaps lack of wisdom on her part. She saw, she saw the movement you know, growing tremendously. Her practice was growing tremendously. She was doing incredible healing and attracting a lot of people to her practice and to her church and could easily have gotten um, caught up in the effect rather than the cause. And that's why we have to be so careful when our lives become so much better as a result of science that we don't get enamored of the effect and start worshiping the effect instead of the cause. Keep, keeping things modest is wisdom. <laughs> oh, and, and you see Mrs. Eddy did. And you also see she was ready. She went from house to house. She had no money. She was had nothing. And she was ready to sacrifice everything for her cause of science then eventually she did become very wealthy but even when she did she she was very mindful she wanted things modest is i love um florence's article about when she went and saw chestnut hill was it that her bedroom what did you say florence yeah i was so surprised it was just a small i mean <laughs> i guess most of our bedrooms are bigger than what she had in, in, amazing just a small a few things in there you know just 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 shows in this big old grand house where she could have had you know a huge bedroom probably yes and yet you know content she was content her love for god was first 
nothing else well, not small. Yeah, and I think the facts are that when the house was prepared for her, yeah. originally her bedroom was was very large. Yeah, they, but, they prepared a very large bedroom for her, and when she and a and large she, study and she, a large study, and when she went in, she said, "This uh -huh. won't do." <laughs> she insisted that the bedroom be made smaller to be more like her bedroom in um, Pleasant, View. Pleasant View. Thank you. And and also her study. She said there would too, take too many steps to cross the room, and. She grew up on a very modest farmhouse in, in Bow, and that's what she loved. Jeremy, were you trying to say something? Oh, about Augusta Stetson earlier in Miss Laney. Uh, Augusta Stetson had sent Mrs. Eddie this letter that Augusta Stetson's people had given her, basically idolizing Augusta Stetson, and Mrs. Eddie wrote back to her, rouse yourself out of this. So it was going on for a while that inflated sense. Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to get into all this, but since we're here, I will, because <laughs> I did bring some things about Augusta Stetson. And this was something that Carpenter wrote in Precepts 2. I get, I, Linda found it a couple of years ago. I, I saved it. Carpenter writes, Mrs. Eddy never had a fair chance nor an open field in her efforts to save Mrs. Stetson. And many of the students and members were to blame for it. Mrs. Eddy continued to hope that Mrs. Stetson might be saved from the error that she yielded to and, and to strive to save her because God told her it was possible. Mrs. Stetson had the finest church in the field. She had the wealthiest and most socially prominent students in New York among her congregation and association. These students would give her anything she wanted, and they did give her much. Her students, who were businessmen, advised her in her investments so that she might be prosperous and live in elegance. All this served to inflame the envy of others who were not as wealthy or prominent as she was. It is a sad commentary on the human heart to say that when Era overtook Mrs. Stetson to the point that she had to be removed, there were many who were not exactly sorry, and lest the field forget about it, they continued to toss her error and reputation about like a rubber ball in order to be certain that forever afterwards, both she and her students would be an anathema. Mm -hmm. Jesus admonished us to forgive our brother 70 times seven. No matter how often Mrs. Stetson departed from the rules of Christian science, Mrs. Eddy forgave her and tried to help her because she was worth being helped. The admonition she wrote for her students was one that she wanted them to follow, not only for the good of Mrs. Stetson, but for their own sakes as well, since no student should be found making a reality of that which he has pledged to reduce to nothingness. So, I, I, you know, there's, there was someone a while ago in, in our, who came to our church or came for a while anyway, and she she was quite a follower of Mrs. Stetson, and she gave me all the books about Mrs. Stetson, which I've read parts of, but not all of it. But Mrs. Eddy, there are many, many letters that say how much she loved Mrs. Stetson. She did see good potential there. It's a worldly materiality. I mean, I, I frankly, I don't believe I ever was at that church. Were you ever at that church, Thomas, the first church? Uh, no, I was not. I it's mean, a, I walked by it a number of times, but I never did walk in. It's supposed to have had, um, you know, gold and marble, and and the upstairs was uh, all uh, a big circle of practitioner rooms. And, um, I, I mean, yes, what Mrs. Eddy was saying, grand, more grandiose than the Mother Church. So that, what is that? I mean, that is, that that's offensive to me frankly i don't i don't care for that but this also this was mrs eddie's last letter to augusta stetson my dear student your kind letter was duly received you know that i love you and you know that god has made and is making his ways and works manifest through divine science i trust he will direct your path in the footsteps of his flock the holy bible science and health and the mother church manual are your safe guides follow them I have not the time to think of the students and all their varied duties of life, 
but I have faith to leave them in the hands of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth none, as ever yours in Christ. That was her last letter. In miscellany, she writes a couple letters. One, she advises everyone to follow the the board of directors, which, of course, at that time, the board of directors, she knew who they were. I guess she trusted them. She also writes a letter that I would prefer not to be involved in this. You know, don't turn to me. And this is what she's saying in this letter, too. She was trusting that they all would make the right decision by turning to God. Um, And by obeying the Bible, science and health, and the manual. Yes. And the manual which, of course, they have not been doing. And if she said herself, we should follow her as far as she follows God or Christ, then that should be, that should be it. Mm-hmm. There is one other thing. This, this book I'm quoting from is Augusta Stetson, Apostle to the World by Gail Weatherby, which I find just really interesting because it's prophetic. The board of trustees of the this First Church of Christ Scientist, New York City, sent to Mrs. Eddy two cardboard tablets with two proposed inscriptions, one to the glory of God, and then another, a tribute, to, a tribute of love to our leader and teacher, Mary Baker Eddy, on the other. Augusta had already obtained Mrs. Eddy's permission to inscribe her leader's name on their new church edifice, So Mrs. Eddy's approval of the second proposed inscription was readily accepted by all. But Mrs. Eddy's response to the trustee's proposal was accompanied by these prophetic words, October 22nd, 1903, in Pleasant View. First Church of Christ Scientist, New York City. My beloved brethren, what if your church edifice in the far future be desecrated and used by others? Mm -hmm. Then your inscription to the glory of God would be a stumbling block. I advise you not to engrave that assertion on stone, but write it in your hearts and demonstrate it in your glorious lives. Let it be at present a silent desire, and God will reward the prayer. A declaration before a preparation of the heart is a hindrance to advancement. The scriptures say, the preparation of the heart and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Believe me, dear ones, that I am writing this from a heart overflowing with love for you and with an earnest prayer for your prosperity. As ever yours lovingly, Mary B.G. Eddy. Now, do you all know what happened to the First Church of Christ Scientist in New, New York. York City? I'll, I'll never forget, I, we were away at the time, and I turned on the television, and there it was that it had closed. I think that was in the 1990s, that church had closed. And then it another church or some other organization bought it. They put banners over where it said First Church of Christ Scientist. And then it's now all been taken apart and is made into a condominium. Mrs. Eddy knew. She knew what was going to happen. She foresaw it. I, I just I just think it's quite something. She, and she knew all of this. She, she knew that there's something else here that was really important to read, too. When it, it was because of Annie Knott that Mrs. Eddy decided to have a church in the first place, Annie Knott kind of pressed her to do it because she said, well, my students, you know, get so much out of Christian science and then they go back to their old Presbyterian or Episcopal or whatever church they were going to and they lose it. So Mrs. Eddy decided to have a church. And then she writes, in 1886, Mrs. Eddy asked Augusta to go to New York City, quote, to help establish the Christianity of Christian science. And she added, there will be plenty of people who will attempt to work in Christian science, but will only pervert it. And the result will be mental relief on a material basis and faith cure. 
I want the Christianity of Christian science established. And it, oh, that's amazing. Isn't that? And it is exactly, that's amazing. It's exactly what happened. And frankly, this goes into the next question about the unity, no, excuse me, about Ephesus. Because in reading about this temple, there was a huge temple in Artemis. Is that what it was called? The yeah. Temple of Artemis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was double the size of the Parthenon. It was huge. And, and it was destroyed twice, first by the flood, and then secondly by an arsonist. And of course, the Christians who came in didn't like it because it wasn't worshiping the one God. The Temple of Artemis, that was the, the god of fertility. Artemis. Yeah, other, other things. And it was known as the um, Diana by the Romans. Artemis was Greek. But it was also one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There's a Greek poet who said, who wrote about it. He had seen all the seven wonders at that time. But then he said, when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted to the clouds... The other marvels lost their brilliancy, and I said, Lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked aught so grand. Basically, then, these things are temples to materiality, aren't they? And I thought, I don't know, I thought it was fascinating, because in many ways, this is what can divide us, or what sometimes does divide us, the worldliness, the materiality of the world, the carnal mind. We began to worship that, and we no longer worship the one God. The who shall be greatest can sometimes sneak in in very subtle ways, in various forms. And here's another one. Here's another one. And, and, and what is being remembered on this day, today? You mean the 9-11? Yeah. yeah. Hatred, hatred of the destruction yes. of a temple. Yeah. Sure. Of materialism. Yeah. In New York City, of all places. You know, yeah. uh, we have to be careful with all that, but uh, Mrs. E Mrs. Evans would say that, though, those huge towers. New York City was was is known to be the world, the, the city of materialism. It's the, you know, all all of that. Uh, it is. And that those huge temples enraged the human mind. Enraged it. So this is what this is what small, modest, quaint, cozy, <laughs> all those things. Uh, this grandiose stuff doesn't appeal at all to me. Never has. It was actually very wonderful to come into this church the first time and have it be, you know, relatively simple. Just a, just a, not a gaudy place because I've been in a lot of churches, a lot of Catholic churches and Christian churches, and fill of gold and icons so to come here and just well and mrs eddie insisted that all the branch churches yeah that they do be simple be simple not have statues or decorative windows or because she she knew to worship false idols or worship you know or to worship statues of jesus and, and or anybody I, else I've, I was truly amazed if you look at a lot of these churches, especially in the big cities, they're all closed now, but they look almost like federal buildings. They're huge, or they look like this Temple of Artem Artemis. They're huge, huge things. They're all closed now. And one other Well, to give you an idea how, how huge they are, I was in London, and uh, I went to a service at the Third Church of London, and it's, the church is enormous. And I walked in there, and if you think about it, think about walking into the side of a church. It's just odd. Like, it just, I didn't understand it, okay? Um, the, you know, 
so so you don't walk in the front door you walk in the side of the building to go into the church it just made no sense to me so later i read about it and um if you think about it the the uh, for the plainfield church that area in the lobby where we you know uh, meet afterwards after service and have some coffee or something and you know donut or whatever well that was the church that was how big the third church was that what remained was just that lobby area it was gigantic but it was so big they they uh you know when the church uh, lost all its members they couldn't maintain such an enormous building, so they actually tore down the church, just kept the lobby. Well, yeah, Gary has a story about that too. I guess it was one once. That's the same was... church where the, the 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 back of the patio area is now a a, a, a uh, an office building, and and the door that you walk into, the, there's a small church on the left and a reading room on the right. Is yeah. that the one? Gary went Yeah, there. yeah, that sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he thought. It's huge. Yeah, what used to be the church is now uh, a patio and an office building. And what's left of the church is uh, what used to be the entrance. Gary thought what? Which is bigger than most Christian sized churches. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, when Gary went there, he said, what the heck's going on? He had a business meeting, and there was this, what did it say? First Church of Christ Sinus London or something. He said, what, what my business meeting in it? Yeah, I was, I, yeah, I had an appointment for a business meeting, at, and I had the address. And I was walking down the street, and where that address was supposed to be, the big sign said, Third Church of Christ Sinus. And I said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same place so I walked time. through the church into a patio area, and there was the building in the back of that lot where my appointment was. So I didn't attend the church like uh, Tom did, but that's how I discovered hmm. that and there was and still is the remnants of a church there. There's one other, but this was a very interesting quote by A.W. Tozer. It says, quote, 100 religious persons knit into unity by careful organization do not constitute a church any more than 11 dead men make a football team. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first requisite is life always. <laughs> so, so you know you can have a lot of people but if they're all dead i mean spiritually dead yeah. then so what so what yeah. mm -hmm. well i <laughs> i think it's fascinating i came here all prepared to talk about augusta stetson and i i didn't know that it was in that quote that tom, <laughs> tom gave us from miscellany so it must have been god's plan because how else do we relate it to ourselves and to our time? But now we can go back, Thomas, to the questions, and, and I'll be quiet. All right, we sort of started on question one, but, uh, you know, our topic, as we all know, is unity of church. And then uh, I hope everybody uh, um, uh, really dug into the Bible readings, which was really to read the entire epistle, um, because there's so much there. And then I got a couple of questions that we can kind of dig in to sort of understand some of what's in that epistle. But the, the first question is really directed about Ephesus, the, uh, the town or city. I'm not quite sure what it was, but uh, there were a number of um, Christian people and Christian activities that went on in Ephesus. And I thought it'd be interesting because we're thinking about this epistle. It's written to the Ephesians. Well, who are the Ephesians, right? Um, so th these are Christians. So what is it that we know about these Christians in Ephesus? May I speak? Yes, please. Okay. Hi. Um, well, uh, I'm going from what John wrote in Revelation 2 when um, uh, he's writing about God directly him to say, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance, 
I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but cannot tolerate wicked people. I'm sorry, that who claim to be apostles and are not and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans. And I did some research on, I was thinking, what was it that they hated about the practice of the Nicolaitans? And online I found that the root of the word Nicolaitans comes from the Greek nikeo, which means to conquer or overcome. And the other part, laos, means people, which the word laity comes from. So when you put the two words together, it especially means the destruction of the people and refers to the earliest form of what we call priest order or clergy which later in the church history divided people and allowed for leadership other than those led by the spirit of the risen Lord. Mm. A good translation of Nicolaitan would be those who prevail over the people. The clerical system later developed into papal hierarchy of priests and clergy lording over the flock. In 1545, the Council of Trent stated, if anyone shall say that there is not in the Christian church, in the Catholic church, a hierarchy established by the divine ordination consisting of bishops, presbyters, and ministers, let him be anathema, which would mean repugnant or offensive. So it's really not a question of whether or not there can be ministry, but um, it's just the separation of hierarchy over the people with a lust for control, manipulation, domination, intimidation, and rebellion of the rightful authority of God. Well, the Protestants followed suit, too, and had their own form of corruption of leadership. I'm so grateful, though, to say I find that this priestly domination does not exist in Plainfield. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be holding this Bible study where in oneness and unity, everyone is seeking for the holy truth and searching together. Peter said, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, not being as lords over God's heritage, but being examples of the flock. Trisha, thank you very much. Beautiful. That'll make a good article, Carol. <laughs> so glad we got it recorded. That was yeah, spectacular. Yeah, have, have it recorded. Thank you. Well, and 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 now thank you. And let let us never ever forget what is the basis of our unity. There is no division. There is no hierarchy. And it's it's the love of of the pure science. Christ, Christianity, and of Mrs. Eddy for giving it to us. That quote that I've, I love, and actually Ingrid quoted it a few weeks ago here from Ways That Are Vain. <laughs> and, you know, it questions, I don't know if I have it here, but anyway, it questions that... Um, I have it here about them, why they're not in one accord. Yes, please read it. It says, the question is often asked, why is there so much dissension among mental practitioners? We answer, because they do not practice in strict accordance with the teachings of Christian science, mind healing. If they did, there would be unity in action, being like the disciples of old with one accord in one place. They would receive a spiritual influx impossible under other conditions and so would recognize and resist the animal magnetism by which they are being deceived and misled. So it's so wonderful and profound. And it's truly what I feel when we get together like this, these Bible studies, we receive this influx. I mean, 
the ideas that come are just amazing. Um, it is an influx. And the reason we go over roundtable and talk about it so that people do understand what the real science is, because it has been perverted, as Mrs. Eddy predicted it would be or might be. Um, it has. It's been perverted. And we've talked about, too, right away, um, what was there, the, the great litigation divided over that. And then divided are the two schools of thought, the Kimball, the Chicago school, and well, I don't know the other, Annie Knott or whatever the other one was. But so what's that all about? That's it's because people don't understand the real science. If just keep studying your book, textbook and prose works, it's all there. Right, Florence? Yes. He, she's written it all there. It's oh. all there. Amazing when you start to reread all these patiently, you know, you're studying it, you'll see it's all there. Questions have been asked and she's answered them all. Every single one. And also that division came about because people wanted to impose upon other people, you know, which mode of yes. thought are you going along with? Well, there's only one mode of thought to go along with, and that's the divine mind, excuse me. So please, let's not go along with somebody else imposing upon someone else. That's just what Patricia was reading, the hierarchy. It's a carnal mind that wants to control. Um, I was, someone was speaking about rich, witchcraft. I was listening to the three things he was saying was manipulate, intimidate, and one other. But the idea of control how are you going to control the other person? It's this form of witchcraft, which is extremely prevalent everywhere you see. You see it. They don't call it witchcraft, but um, what, what do you think all the drug ads are? Manipulation, intimidation, be the other one. Anyway. Destruction of the people. Right? Yeah, destruction of the people. What, what, yes, what Patricia read. I remember... So uh, Go ahead. I have one thing to add is that our teacher uh, impressed upon us that to always remember the mission, which the healing of the world and the Christian Science Movement, and 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 as uh, the years went on, always got back to that. It kept me close to the other people in the church because we were all working for the same end, and that that unity that really has protected us and kept us above personal sense. Thank you. Domination was Thank you. Other? Yeah, domination. Domination. Thank you. Yes. Manipulation, intimidation. Intimidate and domination. Domination. Mm -hmm. Witchcraft. Well, and also, so, to, I think, to recognize that we, you know, we, we understand what's in the textbook to some extent, to the extent that we actually demonstrate it. And prove it in our lives. The the, the okay. danger, of course, is to read it, think you understand it, and and then expostulate what you haven't demonstrated. <laughs> yeah, and I read that Mrs. Eddy says that's a great danger. You can read and think that you you got it. You can, and you yeah. can think because you quote it and read it, you got it, and then you wonder why you don't got it. <laughs> you got to connect the dots. Right. Then you wonder why it doesn't work after a while. Well, mm -hmm. it works. You just aren't working it correctly. Somehow, you know, it's amazing, and I'm sure I did it too. You think if you read it and read it, it's okay if you resent. It's okay if you're fearful. It's okay if you're negative. That's okay, just as long as you're reading it. <laughs> well, no, you read it to get rid of all the that carnal mind going on, then you're living it. I think the pond and purpose uh, kind of explains it, the different stages, right? Moving right, right out of all this. Yes. Pond and purpose, ways that are vain. These were things we were given. And thank God we were. And now um, Florence is re reading prose work starting with Unity of Good. We're going to get it out. Gary's already done it, and I did part of it too. And we're going, to, but we're going to get a male and female voice on 
on all of it, science and health too. And we're also going to, Gary's doing the first edition, getting the truth out in every way we can. That's what's going to heal the leaven of truth. So who else? I'm talking too much. I'm trying not to. <laughs> well, I, I would want, hope when we get to unity, the one thing that always struck me was that in the Boston model, they wanted uniformity. And that's the one thing there. It's not about uniformity. A big difference. Yeah. Thank you. Totally. Yes. Thank you. So uh, when I when I uh, decided to uh, do a Bible study in Ephesians, that was like, right, Linda, that was like many, many, many months ago, right? Yes. <laughs> and and then this summer I wrote out the questions, um, and so I really had no no idea what was in the lesson that we would have for tomorrow. But uh, so this question I wrote, um, first question about uh, Christianity in Ephesus. Uh, what, what is it in our lesson this week that uh, can help answer that question? What is it about Christianity in Ephesus that we see in our lesson this week? I'm sorry if this is a trick question, but anyway. <laughs> well, I, you know, the, the, the lesson is about substance. And what is what is it that is our substance? Ephesus was a, was a prosperous city, right? I mean, it was a center of trade, um, and uh, you know, was maybe not as prosperous as New York City, but but there was a sense of material substance there. Well, it says in First Timothy, charge them that are rich in this world that they not be high-minded or trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That's in our lesson this week. Was it the Lot and Abram, the cattle? Uh, well, I'm sorry to ask a trick question. So it's it's number three. Apollos watered. Where did Apollos water? <laughs> Ephesus. Ah. Oh. He was living in Alexandria, and then he went to uh, Ephesus, and, and um, um, that's where he did his watering and so forth. Hmm. Well, I did not know that. Thank you. Apollos, uh, God gave the increase. <laughs> when they say Apollos watered, do they mean he preached? Was Apollos? I'm sorry, a I couldn't hear that. Apollos was one of the guys that followed Paul around. It was some guy's name. Oh. Mm -hmm. Or and, and wait, he had a message because I didn't get that. Well, he was a um, uh, a Jew and a Christian and living in Alexandria, Egypt, and he was someone who knew a whole lot about the Bible. Really, really understood it well. And it was his belief that um, the Bible confirmed that um, Jesus was the Messiah. And so he felt compelled to go over to, um, I don't know if it's Turkey or Asia Minor, whatever that area, to tell people that. Thank you. Thank oh, you. all right. Thank you. Because I knew Ephesus, they had all different beliefs that were spoken about. And I guess they talked openly. Um, including Paul and Timothy and all the others, and and, they, and then they came to a consensus where Christianity was the best. Yeah, I mean, so Apollos, you know, uh, um, really understood who Jesus was, and he wanted to tell other people that, based on what he knew in the Bible. Got it. Thank you. So maybe we can talk about question two, which actually we have been talking about. Um, uh, so anyway, the, what question two is, what is meant by unity of the spirit in the bond of peace? And this comes from Ephesians chapter four, verse three. Well, I, in my student, New Testament compilation, 
that I have from my grandfather, there was um, um, one translation from Moffat says, zealous in love to preserve the unity of the spirit by binding peace upon yourself. And then there's, it goes on um, that the Greek translation of endeavoring is really means it's not, it's a little bit more, um, it's a, it's, well, it says that several translators point out the word endeavoring is not strong enough term to convey the exact force of the original Greek. Diligence more nearly conveys the exact <clears throat> sense. And um, the, the spirit unites those who are separated um, from by race and custom. So it was to unite those that thought, you know, the, the Gentiles were really the ones who were mostly, this was mostly addressed to. It was uniting the, that thought Gentile and the Jews who thought that they were more entitled um, because of their race and, and um, that they were more entitled to the, um, the truth to the, and that the Gentiles were um, not amongst those that, you know, it's where it's re- divide. I think there was something. Well, it was uniting the two, and that that we are all one in in Christ, and um, you know, just uh, to keep the separation. I mean, to unite what seemed to be the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. What is a bond? Togetherness. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an association, an affiliation. It's a it's a connection between people that is very strong, isn't it? Yes. I think it's something that unites um and here it's is the love for God and man. That is everybody feeling that it's more the feeling of it than they talking of it that um, I mean, unites us yeah this well, is thank you for that that I'm sorry to interrupt that well this is telling us where the unity comes from isn't it yeah yes yeah, thank you mm-hmm. for that that was actually what I thought was the most important word in that whole thing but thank you Yeah, and this is how we oh, yeah. we get over a personal sense of things. You know, people getting feelings hurt or whatever. It, it, it's immaterial to the work that has to be done here. We we don't let that stop us from uh, or make it a stumbling block. It's our love for God. This is something I, I will call a contribution from Carrie. She found this in an August 1892 issue of the journal, and it was preached at Chickering Hall, so it's a good chance this is from Mrs. Eddy. Uh, and and it's, it's called, In Union There is Strength. A high sense of spiritual individuality never means that the individual shall subserve his personal ends at the expense of the whole, so that some ambitious and aspiring member can take things into his own, own hands and run matters to suit himself. This would result in destruction to the cause of humanity. But since there are diversities of gifts and diversities of administrations bestowed on men, infinite wisdom has appointed that the good of all is to be attained by allowing these diversities, working through the one and self-same spirit, to accomplish that which each supplieth for the welfare of the whole body. So while none may have his own way or will as against the many, the common good of the whole is subserved by permitting the largest sense of individuality consistent with truth. Since Christian science does not dread the light, being itself light, it follows that this light must work its benign results in accordance with immutable principle, which secures the rights of all. 
these things seem hard for us to reduce to practice in our daily intercourse with one another. So long have we been under the law of carnal commandments. So long have we lived in the seeming dominion of the senses. But, brethren and friends, the truth sets free from the law of sin and death. Guided by principle, as revealed in our soul textbook, the Bible interpreted through its key, science and health, it is possible for us to dwell together, keeping the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Amen. Because <clears throat> isn't that sometimes you, you see one controlling person who is ambitious, who is not for the right motives, wants to rule everybody. And if everyone else shuts up and lets that happen, well, that's not good. And we, don't we see it everywhere? <laughs> not only in communities and churches and businesses, but what about our governments, our local and federal governments? I mean, don't we see one rule <laughs> after the other trying to control people? And where does that lead? Not good. Can't be good. If the right people are in government, then maybe they will be following Christ and yeah. can all the laws will be as God would have them and so forth. And that's a good prayer because right now it seems to attract, you know, the ambitious, the worldly, the people who want money, greed. We can know that that's going to overturn, and we will have Christly, Christly people in office. Yeah, and let them desire to be public servants and not leaders. Yes, public yeah. servants. Hmm. Just work for God. And, and that, you is know, oh, and Paul you know, in Ephesus, he he thrived on on, I guess you call it discussion or division. I mean, there was a, a Paulus who said he tried to teach the Jews to accept Christ, and then it was he, Paul thought he was said he was the uh, he was the prophet or the apostle for the Gentiles. He's trying to bring more of them to the Messiah, but he he preached through through all of that and was I guess felt inspired and, and used that as a strength, I guess. If we could do likewise, probably more would be done in this age. Yes. I don't know if it was mentioned. I was a little late of phoning in, but that this letter to Ephesians was written by Paul when he was in prison. And it says in my commentary here that Paul's imprisonment, which he referred to in uh, Ephesians 3, 1, where it says, for I... For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Paul's imprisonment, which he referred to, resulted from the stand which he took in behalf of the Gentiles, namely that both Jews and Gentiles had an equal right to the truth and an equal ability to demonstrate it, since both were in reality united to their common father. To the Jews, this teaching was rank heresy. And then he goes on to talk about how the parable of the prodigal son is, was uh, the Jews knew what that was about. <laughs> That's why they hated him so much because they, they knew that the prodigal son was, they were refer, he was referring to the Gentiles as the prodigal son and the elder son as the Jews. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's it, it, like the whole. It says the whole situation concerning salvation was such as would seem to fulfill one possible meaning of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. The elder son, in other words, the Jew, is complaining to the father that he has dutifully fulfilled his wishes through compliance with the Mosaic law, and yet has been given no such feast, no fatted calf, nothing, in fact, beyond the all that I have is thine. The prodigal son, the Gentile's present role, has been seemingly indifferent to the father, has been lost sight of, and is now found, bereft of place, 
naked as to his vestments of truth and hungering for even a servant's portion. The elder son, the Jew, must have realized that the point of Jesus' parable was aimed at his own race and the resultant sense of guilt and rebellion expressed itself in committing Paul to prison. Hmm. Fascinating. Okay. Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and are the same body and partakers of his promise, and that's Christ by the gospel. Thank you. It's like the laborers and, and their reward. Uh, God's love for everyone, Christian or not Christian, and this awakening to it, to know it. Thank you. And this is Christ's Christianity. And that is in the lesson, too. Neither was it last week. Well, neither Bond nor Jew, you know, we're all united. Freeborn. We, freeborn. We do not divide ourselves into categories. Mm -hmm. God doesn't, anyway. We, we should yeah. not. God does not. Um, I, I heard something. You asked about your government, how your government is about unity and everything. And I heard uh, Joe Biden's speech for 9-11 here in our news, and I, it was about unity. I don't know if you have heard it. Or... No, no. No, that's good it was to be. A great speech, I mean, about unity and how the people after it happened, how many people helped each other and how how the state can only work if it's working together. It was a very beautiful speech. I was very really impressed. And I said oh, to I'll tell you a story. When, I was, when that happened, I remember there was a huge group that came from Oregon, and all they did was go around and hug people. Oh. So one woman from Oregon gave me a big hug. Oh. <laughs> nice. Oh, nice. I don't know who they were, but uh, anyway, uh, it was kind of nice. <laughs> Good for Oregon. Well, and, and yeah, it was from Oregon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was like so, so one one thing I wanted to mention was um, I I really really like we have a link on this on our website uh, to Webster's. So then I'll take a word that I find interesting or maybe a word that I don't quite understand and I'll look it up. And so we're talking about peace. And so I looked that up and Webster says harmony. That's one of the definitions. And then he continues on harmony and says, a state of reconciliation between parties at variance. So then I w looked up reconcile. And, um, you know, it says here, to call back into union and friendship the affections which have been alienated. But you think about that, to call back into union and, and, and friendship. Um, and I think that's what's so important. A lot of times we might think of, uh, we discuss uh, atonement, you know, of one with God. Well, um, day by day, we're, we're dealing with people. We go to church and we deal with the, the people within the church and so forth. And, and how are we interacting with them? And so this alignment that we have with God really means, you know, our community, too. Thank you. And that is the fundamental basis of our unity and our peace with one another is our unity with God. And that is how someone mentioned, you know, our, the Plainfield Church. Well, one of the lessons we have learned through our excommunication and our experience with, with all of the literature that we have been blessed with and understanding Mrs. Eddy's uh, revelation and, and her life, and the founding of the church, we have learned the, the, the danger of allowing the human mind to do anything, literally, to do anything. So when people with the love in their hearts and the truth in their hearts come to us and they want to do something to prosper the cause of Christian science, our answer is go for it. Do it. Whatever you're inspired to do, do it. And as a result of that, we have, you know, a relatively small group of people who are actually doing the work. 
accomplishing an incredible amount that is blessing thousands, millions, we don't know how many people. But there aren't a lot of rules. There aren't committees. And, and that's for, for a reason. It's, it's, we don't want to invite the human mind to start taking charge in any way. And when people come to this church, you know, when they are at one with God, they flourish and they fit in. And, and we work together harmoniously. If someone comes full of pride or with a lot of human will or, want, you know, in the wrong mind, uh, they are very uncomfortable <laughs> and they take themselves out. We don't excommunicate people here. That doesn't work. It doesn't prosper the cause of Christian science. So it's a it's a wonderful lesson, and I hope we all remember it forever. It's the only way we we will exist. Once we lose that, we lose everything. It's the only way we can exist. I call it a spiritual organization, which is not an oxymoron. And I love just that last question, which is a quote from He is our peace. How do we get it? He. It's the only way we get it. It's the only way we'll have no more war, right? We can right. stop wars. You can stop it and insist no one fighting. Um, but... Then, then it erupts again and again and again. Only when the Christ in our hearts is our peace. And we are at peace with ourselves, with God, and then with each other. Yeah, I love what it says, have broken down the middle wall, partition between us. Yes. Uh -huh. And whatever that middle wall is, whatever it claims, because right now, and it's only error trying to claim, you know, the different divisions god never said it and we don't have to believe it it's a lie that's just one wall they put puts a whole maze in front of us <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> who are we going to fight with today <laughs> oh my in, uh, in, 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 oh, in, the christian science helped us to have this peace through and victory eternal through oneness when everyone, God is all in all, and, <clears throat> and he's included, he includes all, and as each accepts that and proves it, you can't have anything but peace and dominion. Yes. Yeah. God's allness and his presence, um, the three omnis, and his, <laughs> you should, that should give us peace. Spurgeon emphasizes that uh, envy and anger cannot be part of this bond of peace. And we, we can all see why. Mm -hmm. And you see, that's part of the Ten Commandments. The, thou shalt yeah. not covet. Thou shalt not. Well, all the others are usually about anger. Kill certainly is. Falseness. Mm -hmm. well, in reference to this um, last question, I found this in my book, the student reference, but it, it says Paul's reference to the middle wall of partition is claimed by some literalists to be confined in import to the description of the wall which bound the precincts within the temple, beyond which the Gentiles could not go, the court of the Gentiles. Others, with an eye to symbolism, believe that Paul was implying in this phrase the mosaic economy or observances, which effectually separated the Gentiles from the Jewish concept of salvation and its requirements. Lastly, there are those who hold that metaphysically considered wall stands for the concept of matter, the sense of which seems to affect a separation in the minds of materialists, the real Gentiles, from the divine mind, or God and his, and his children. These, his ideas, are symbolized by the term Jews. 
children of Judah. And then it says, this view accords with the definition of Judah found on page 589 in Science and Health. And that definition, and this I found interesting because it goes with the first, um, with the quote at the beginning, there is no matter, is not only the axiom of true Christian science, but is the only basis upon which the science can be demonstrated. So the definition of Judah, a corporeal material belief progressing and disappearing, the spiritual understanding of God and man appearing. So I thought that was tied in with the quote, first quote. Thank you. Paul also tells us so many things. He has so much in here, not just to be unified, but he tells us to wake thou that sleepest and walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. He tells us because the days are evil, and he tells us at the end to put on the armor of God. So it's very active, very strong, and there's a lot of and not to be hateful and got gossip. And so there's a lot, a lot involved in this unity, not just very stirring, very strong. Thank you. <clears throat> Not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So this unity has to have action. You know, a lot of times I found in the church I came from before here was all this talk. Well, all hell is breaking loose. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, the unity was it? Yeah, it wasn't. Where there is no peace. Right. And then this the other, you know, we because you can't be unified with the carnal mind. You cannot do that. And if someone is in that wrong mind, there will be separation. And that's a different kind. Of, that's not right. That's not unity. That's uniformity. Yeah, mm. you you cannot right. you cannot do that. So but, and don't anyone think that. So that means you're friends with everybody. Right. You cannot be friends with the carnal mind. And if someone is expressing that carnal mind, your friendship might have to. Stop at least for a while. So when someone gives a speech on unity, just t take take it for what it's worth and remember where they're coming from. Are they coming from the human mind or the divine mind? Yeah, are they just trying to uniformity um, get you? Get you to be uniform with their with what their desires. I mean, that's what Hitler did. <laughs> so that's mass mesmerism. That's not unity. Anybody else, please? Just wanted to say one thing about secrecy. Error can only get away with what it does if it remains hidden, obscured, or in secret. Mm -hmm. Whereas if things are out in the open where all can see, and that way you can release your human will and say, Dear Father, this is what you want, fine. And if it's not what you want, well, then I don't want it either. So no secrecy. The occult means hidden. Right. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Let God be true and every man a liar, that's all. Yes. Well, I, I hope everybody enjoyed the Bible study today. And, uh, um, so since we're gone beyond, beyond the hour, I'm okay to go beyond if someone else wants to do that. But, uh, we, we were reading the entire epistle of Ephesians for a reason, because uh, we will continue with Ephesians in the next Bible study. Excellent. So actually, if anybody had any thoughts on, um, you know, the last couple of questions, uh, we can also bring that up at the next uh, Bible study. Um, and because uh, I think there's so much in here, and I, I love this thought of uh, unity. Um, and uh, no one brought this up, but I, I uh, would like to read this. This is, uh, so question two, you know, was... Um, uh, uh, Number uh, text number three, but let's uh, reading after that says here, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Beautiful. Thank you. Good Good ending. Thank you, thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, and thank everybody you, else who contributed. Thank you. 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 Th